wish you a warm welcome to EcoBank's webinar. Our webinar this morning is on the impact of COVID-19 and the focus will be twofold. We'll talk about the impact on the economies that we're operating in the region. And we'll also talk about the impact on commodity prices in the region. And we'll give you our views and outlook. And we'll also touch on, on our perspective on the African continental free trade area and how you can position yourselves to take advantage of its benefits. Please note, this session will be recorded and the recording will be made available to you all afterwards. I'd like to give you a quick overview of how we'll be spending the next one and a half hours. Um, and I'll be projecting the agenda um, for the session shortly. We will begin right after my, my brief welcome here with an address from our Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Ade Ayeyemi. And right after that, we'll go into presentation sessions, which will be led by our speakers, Ted George and Gaimin Nonyane. I'll speak about them a little bit more uh, when I introduce them. Due to timing constraints, we may not be able to answer all the questions that you will be posting to us for these presenters, but be assured that all questions will receive an answer even if we do so afterwards. You'll find a text box to the right-hand side of your screens where you can put all your questions down for us. We hope to close this session at about 11.30 GMT. And at that time, uh, Nana Aban, who is our group consumer banking head, will deliver to us a closing speech. And now I'll hand over to our group chief executive officer, Mr. Ade Ayeyemi. Ade, your audience. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you so much for joining and participating in this webinar today. The world as we know it is going through unprecedented times. I think you've heard that said so many times. The COVID-19 pandemic is having a significant impact on economies, on livelihoods, and on various ways of working. Africa has not been spared. While the pandemic does not seem to have caused the huge fatalities projected for the continent, it has led to economic and social challenges and a growing health and economic crisis. As a bank operating in 33 Africa countries across Middle Africa, we see the effects of the ongoing pandemic every day we talk to our clients and ourselves. Most businesses are facing any shortfall, changes in operating models, and significant uncertainties, both for businesses and for individuals. With imperative to weather the pandemic storm top of mind for most businesses, we will today be reflecting on the impact of the pandemic on the African economies with a focus on commodity markets and supply chains. We share some tips on navigating African markets in this new era and how businesses may be able to capture opportunities that arise from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. After all, the purpose of the agreement is to make sure that we can do better together. COVID-19 has also accelerated the rapid use of digital payments, solutions and interaction modes. This webinar and the one following on the fifth of August will also discuss discuss how you may transform your business to accelerate the adoption of digital payments. Historically, we used to say that we take work to where people are. But today, with the convenient power of technology that is available, we can take the work to where the people choose to be. They no longer need to live where, they, they no longer need to vacate where they prefer to live the work and actually go to them where they are. I do hope you find the discussions informative and useful. Be sure that we'll continue to support you in your businesses. And now hand over to our moderator for today, 
Mr. Sebastian Ashon Katai, who will go over the agenda and also introduce the speaker. Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ade. Thank you very much, Ade. And now I'll introduce our speakers for the morning. Firstly, Dr. Ted George, um, who is a founder and chief narrative officer of Cleos Advisory. Ted actually worked at EchoBank for a few years where he headed up our group research function. And his areas of speciality include soft commodities, agribusiness, trade, and disruptive technology. And he has over 20 years of experience in African markets. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. It's great to join you. Thank you. And we also have Gaming Nanyone, who's a macroeconomic expert and a strategist at K Frontier Solutions. Gaming's focus is providing intelligence and strategic advisory services on emerging and frontier markets. She spent time at EcoBank as well, where she headed our economic research for the group, and she has substantial experience in Africa as well both at EcoBank and with the World Bank as an economic consultant. And with that, I'll leave the floor to them. Ted, Gaiman, your audience. It's a pleasure to be um, uh, uh, brought back to EcoBank and to be able to present to your clients. Um, and I'm very happy to do it with my former colleague as well, Gaiman Nanyan. The dream team is back together. Uh, Gaiman, would you like to say hi? Hi, everyone. Um, as Sebastian just mentioned, I'm also an ex eco banker and um, I'm delighted to be with you today to, to talk about the global and economic outlook of sub Saharan Africa. Thank you. Thanks, Gaiman. So, um, as the CEO said, uh, we are in challenging and unprecedented times. Those are overused words. Uh, you could probably say for many of us, we've never been in such a situation in our professional lives. And so we really need to have some ideas on how we move forward uh, and how we address not just the challenges, but the enormous opportunities for transformation that COVID is forcing in emerging markets and particularly in Africa. So without further ado, uh, let, we're going to have uh, three sessions or three different presentations, one on the global outlook, setting the scene for our views on Africa, and then a deep dive on the macroeconomic outlook for Africa and also commodities and trade. So why don't we start with uh, the elephant that we are all tired of having in the bedroom, COVID-19. The numbers really speak for themselves. Um, over 16 million global infections and rising. And it's not even clear if we are out of the first wave yet. We could be here for a long time. As Winston Churchill famously said after the Battle of El Alamein, it's not the end, it's not uh, the beginning of the end, but it might be the end of the beginning. And there's still a long way to go. And it's particularly worrying with Africa, if you look at the charts here on this page, because we have over half a million cases, over 12,000 deaths. But there's clearly something wrong with the numbers. Um, they are not testing enough. Um, there is no way that if you look at the top right chart there, that South Africa has actually 77% of all cases in Africa. And Nigeria, which is a much larger economy and population, has just 7%. Whatever Donald Trump might say, more testing will definitely show there are a lot more cases out there. There is a real concern there could be a silent epidemic going on in Africa, which is just not getting the global attention that the other hotspots are at the moment. And of course, there are many governments who appear to have simply let the virus spread throughout their populations. This will have a huge impact going forward. A lot of comparisons have been made with Africa and how it handled the Ebola crisis. And particularly in West Africa, it was very impressive how that was contained, considering how infectious Ebola is. But the thing about Ebola is it's very different from COVID. Ebola, you are only infectious when you are showing symptoms and they are very obvious. If you have a proper public information campaign, a tracing and uh, an isolation of people infected, you can control it. With COVID, you can walk around it uh, with it for years, infecting people, not even realizing you have it. But there is reason for hope. There are two vaccines currently, which are now in final trials, one in the UK and the USA. There are at least 12 others uh, under development. Uh, and um, you know, even though it might be quite a while to see whether those are effective, the most important thing is that treatments for the disease are improving. There are already freely available drugs which can greatly reduce the death for the most uh, sick people. They can reduce the time people spend on ventilators. And as time goes on and we understand so much more than we knew back in January this year, it will become more manageable. And this is the real key thing here. 
all businesses need to accept that we have to live with COVID, not just to get around with it, but actually have a business model which incorporates it and enables us to do our business. Now, when it comes to the political risks, there are many of them hanging over the global outlook. The most important one getting all the press is the US election on the 3rd of November in less than 100 days. We are all aware that the Trump administration and the people who support them are prepared to do anything to get reelected. And this is against a backdrop of a huge economic downturn and, of course, seething rage from the Black Lives Movement and a very heavy handed response to some of the protests in Portland. It's, uh, the Trump administration is already casting doubts over the legitimacy um, of postal votes. It makes us think of the whole hanging chads um, controversy back in 2001 in Florida. And this is a major concern and likely the temperature will be ramped up going forward. Running concurrently, we have the standoff with China. And that really is quite important because the tensions are rising. It's not just about trade and the very large tariffs that were introduced by the USA. We've also seen that they're going directly after Chinese uh, economic, uh, companies, for example, Huawei. We've seen the UK following suit on that one as well. And of course, there have been rising tensions in the South China Sea, where China accuses, uh, where Washington accuses China of militarizing. All of these things could potentially blow up into something bigger in the context of uh, the, the American election coming up. And then let's not forget our old friend Brexit, something that we all wanted to uh, try and forget here in the UK. But the UK left the European Union officially in January. The end of this year is when a trade deal was supposed to be agreed. Now, the idea that a trade deal could be uh, negotiated, which would normally take a decade in just six months at the same time as a pandemic, is perhaps uh, wishful thinking. And it's likely there'll be further delays and that perhaps protests over what happens with a potential extension to these negotiations. And then amongst all of this, we shouldn't forget perhaps the biggest issue which has been facing the world, climate change. If we go back to January before COVID stole the headlines, everyone was talking about the fires in uh, the wildfires in Australia, um, the, the unbelievably hot um, uh, summers we've been having for the past 10 years, Greta Thunberg speaking in the press. All of that was pushed to the side. That will come back. That has not gone away. We are just starting the hurricane season in the Caribbean and the US. Um, we need to hold on to our horses. So that is uh, the outlook in terms of politically and, and risk. Now I'd like to hand over to Gaiman to talk about the macro global outlook. Gaiman. Thank you, Ted. Um, without further ado, I'll go straight to the global economic piece. Well, 2020 started off with great economic optimism driven by a US-led strong recovery. And then COVID happened. From an economic perspective, the situation is quite grim across the world, but I can stress it's not all doom. In March, we saw a major collapse in global confidence and a dislocation in global markets. And this prompted world authorities to respond swiftly and bullishly to mitigate the impact. As we can see in the top left charts, G4 central banks, that's the US Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England and the Bank of Japan, They've all injected billions into the, into their economies. And this has led to the balance sheets growing by about 13% of GDP since February. In fact, last week we saw EU leaders um, approve about 750 billion euro stimulus package in response to the crisis. African central banks have also joined the cohorts of global banks, and we've seen um, banks like South Africa Central Bank, um, Kenya and Ghana also aggressively cutting rates in response to the crisis. Also in the right hand charts, we can see that the IMF has provided unprecedented emergency support to South African, to um, sub-Saharan African countries, with Nigeria being the top beneficiary. And just yesterday, we saw South Africa get an approval of about 4.3 billion in terms of um, IMF support. So thanks to all this support, we've now seen um, the, the global financial market stabilize. And this has helped to avert large scale bankruptcies and even much more greater job losses. As the top chart shows, the global equity market has rebounded Although, as we can see from the charts, frontier markets are still lagging behind emerging markets. The bottom um, left chart shows that the PMI, which is a leading economic indicator that assesses firms' purchasing activity, has also picked up, but it still remains below the 50 benchmark points in the US and Eurozone. 
And this is quite worrying because these markets account for about 50% or 60% of Sub-Saharan Africa's exports. Credit spreads have also narrowed in, in emerging markets, and this reflects investor sentiments despite rising COVID cases. And for example, African sovereigns such as Nigeria and Ghana, we've seen foreign debt bonds return to nearly pre-crisis levels of about 8% and helping to boost um, confidence. At the same time, the US unemployment rate, a key indicator for consumer spending, has started to recover, although the resurgence rate in the US at the moment raises significant uncertainty about the situation. While we've seen the global financial market stabilizing, in terms of the real economy, we've seen um, a sharp decline in so many countries since Q1, Q2 this year. And going forward for the year as a whole, we expect the global economy to record its sharpest decline since World War II. And this simply demonstrates the depth of the crisis and the current disconnect that we're seeing between the global financial markets and the global real sector. As the left hand chart shows, all major markets will be hit hard by the crisis. And most importantly, the euro area, which accounts for about 40 percent of um, Africa's um, exports. However, assuming that policy support continues and we continue to see further reopening of economies, we expect the global downturn not to be as deep and as long as in World War II. In 2021, the, 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 the prospect is likely to be much more positive. The world economy should recover slowly, but I must stress that in the absence of effective and affordable vaccine, because not everyone might be able to afford the vaccine, or we might have the US economy um, buying all the supplies in the global markets. We're mm -hmm. likely to see um, some, some uncertainty in the markets and the strength of the recovery will remain um, in doubt with the impact on even across regions and across sectors. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Thank you, Gaiman. So I'd like to just finish uh, with an outlook for world trade and also global supply chains. So the first thing to say is that world trade has suffered its worst contraction on record. Um, the WTO goods trade barometer slumped to 87.6 in the second quarter of this year, the lowest value on record. And in fact, if you look at the graphic there, it doesn't actually go below 90. We are so low on fuel that in fact, uh, the dial won't go down any further. And what is concerning about this is that world merchandise trade was already slowing before COVID kicked off. If you look at the chart in the middle there, it fell from a peak of growth of 5.6% in the last quarter of 2017 to a contraction of 1% in the last quarter of 2019. And of course, this is before the COVID lockdown. So it is likely this could have accelerated um, much more during the first half of the year. Not all of the indices are below trend, but what is particularly worrying is for automotive products, export orders, air freight and container shipping. All of them were lower at the end of last year, and the fact is they're likely to have been squeezed even more because of COVID. But the important thing to remember here is that even though global supply chains have been disrupted, they continue to function. Uh, trade volumes might have dropped, but the ports are still open. And when we come to see the disruption that has occurred, it hasn't been as serious as been expected for a lot of the critical supply chains out there. If we look at the chart on the left there, what has really been exposed by COVID is how reliant the world has become on Chinese intermediate projects for their manufacturing base. Um, certainly in the case of the USA, it's over a third. And in the case of a lot of Europe, it's over 25%. Now, China is booming back to life, particularly its factories, but this is against weak global demand and also a concern that there could be a second wave in China as well, which could again shut down the manufacturing hubs. We've certainly seen some disruption uh, manufacturing hubs in South Asia for textiles and in Southeast Asia for processing, particularly of cashews, uh, um, but they are adapting. And as you can see from these photographs, um, they are back online and they are trying to uh, start producing and processing as they were beforehand. And that is basically quite encouraging in terms of what can be achieved during the disruption for COVID. But uh, notwithstanding the fact there has been a general drop in demand, there has also been a surge for certain products. Anyone who tries to get personal protective equipment or toilet paper would probably know what I'm talking about there.
But the other big crisis that has been exposed by uh, COVID is reckless trading and fraud, one of the biggest risks facing trade finance. Warren Buffett famously said, only when the tide goes out, do you discover who's been swimming naked. Well, it turns out many have been swimming naked, and in fact, many have been caught uh, up to some uh, very uh, unsavory antics under the waterline. The first half of 2020 has witnessed several spectacular collapses of commodity traders. Um, these include um, the oil trader Hin Long, which overstated its assets by $3 billion, quite an oversight, and was discovered to have issued 60 LCs worth a billion and a half to finance cargoes that either didn't exist or were pledged to multiple buyers. Another oil trader, Zenrock, collapsed with 600 million of liabilities. Uh, the coal trader, AgriTrade, with 1.5 billion of liabilities. Hontop, owned by China's Wanda Group, with another half billion. And the agri-foods, coal and metals trader, Phoenix Commodities, with one and a half billion. All told, uh, nearly $8 billion of losses to dozens of banks who will need to take COVID haircuts. Uh, and like all self-inflicted haircuts during lockdown, they will be messy. All five of these traders were guilty of the oldest trick in the book, of using duplicate invoices and pledging the same cargoes to multiple buyers. Some of the cases of fraud uncovered are breathtaking in their audacity. If we take the case of Kingold, one of China's largest jewelry, market, uh, jewelry makers listed on the NASDAQ. The company collapsed in May, owing two and a half billion dollars to more than a dozen Chinese banks. But when the banks went to seize the gold against which the money had been lent, they discovered that 83 tons of gold bars worth five billion dollars were actually copper bars covered in gold. And it's not just the trade that's been caught out. Um, uh, last month, we saw Wirecard, one of the world's most valuable payment companies, collapse after a massive fraud, leaving liabilities of four billion. What all of this means is that due diligence and fraud detection will be key for all companies going ahead. Despite all of the risks out there from COVID, fraud still means uh, remains the key cause for losses in trade. So that is the general overview. I'd now like to move on to the macro overview for um, Africa. Gaiman, if you want to share your screen. OK, thank you. Um, so my my um, presentation on the regional outlook will be in two parts. Um, first, I'll take a look at um, the COVID crisis on Middle Africa's real economy and then look at the policy responses that have been triggered as a result of the crisis and how this will shape the, the landscape, the economic landscape in the region. And second, I'll look at some debt and effects, liquidity and currency issues that are likely to affect um, the region and before that, um, I'd like Ted to just present on the political risk situation in the region. Thanks, Gaiman. Yes, so there are many political and security risks facing sub-Saharan Africa in the second half of this year, um, and many of them relate to elections. You can see the number of elections that there are for this year, most of them uh, during the last quarter as well, which brings a huge amount of uh, uh, insecurity for the second half of the year. Uh, perhaps the most worrying is the sudden death of Amadou Koulibaly uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, which has brought uncertainty to October's presidential election in Cote d'Ivoire. President Rattara had said that he would stand down and would not seek another term, and now they're trying to find another candidate. The fact that this occurs also in October at the start of the cocoa season really adds a lot of tension to what is happening in Cote d'Ivoire. We've also seen protests in Mali over the disputed elections in March, although the protesters have dropped their demands for the president to step down and are now really asking for a number of issues related to social policy. We also see the long-standing problem of jihadist forces in the three frontiers region, Burkina Faso, Niger and Chad. Um, they haven't gone away, and now we are in a situation where there are many people who've been put out of work, uh, many, many young men looking for something to do, that is ideal recruiting ground for them as well. So that is something which is of great concern. Looking to the other side of the continent, we also have unrest in Ethiopia over the death of a popular aroma singer, and this has certainly raised the stakes in the parliamentary elections this August. Uh, there are many hopes for reform um, in Ethiopia under its prime minister, but there are many tensions that have been brewing there for years, and managing these has, uh, is going to be one of the most difficult things over the coming months in Ethiopia. And then, of course, we have elections for the ruling opposition part, uh, the ruling party in Tanzania, Guinea, Burkina Faso, and the CAR, all of which um, are likely to raise tensions as well. 
all told, it's going to be a very busy um, end of year when it comes to elections in Africa and want to watch. Back to you, Gany. Okay, thank you, Ted. Well, as we've just seen in the global piece, um, major markets are likely to contract this year. And of course, this has implications for sub-Saharan Africa. The region is likely to record its worst economic downturn in decades. The first chart shows that the economy, the region has not um, contracted um, since the early 1990s. And this is largely owing to declines in global trade, capital inflows, consumption and investment spending associated with the travel restrictions, weak confidence and social distancing that we're seeing at the moment. In fact, the World Bank now estimates that the COVID crisis will cause up to nearly 80 billion in output losses in the region just for this year alone. In the second, in the sec right hand chart, we see that um, a number of regions are likely to be adversely impacted. In particular, it will be major oil exporting regions such as Nigeria and Central Africa. And there's also Angola in Southern Africa. And this highly reflects the strong oil commodity dependence and their exposure to recent oil price shocks. But other regions like Awa, Yomwa, and East Africa, even though they will experience some downturns, it will not be as severe as what will be seen in um, other markets. In 2021, a V-shaped recovery is likely, but this is subject to a high degree of uncertainty, which I'll talk about later. So against the backdrop of the decline in GDP in the earlier slide and high population, increased supply chain challenges, per capita income, which is a key indicator that looks at the individual standard of living, is likely to contract sharply this year, and this is going to affect disposable income. At the same time, the top right-hand chart shows that inflation will also rise and this will continue to weigh on consumers' purchasing power, potentially reducing sales. And this, one of the reasons for the high inflation is because food prices, which have a very high weighting in overall CPI baskets, has been rising in many countries. And part of that is due to the supply chain, chain challenges that has been caused by the COVID crisis. In Ethiopia and in Nigeria, we're likely to see much higher inflation rates. And the main reason for that, as we see in the chart at the bottom, is because of the um, high food price um, weightings, as well as other factors. In contrast, Kenya is likely to experience lower inflation, owing to lower food prices. And with Kenya, there seems to be a deflationary effect, and this could be as a result of weaker consumer spending. But in 2021, the situation is likely to improve as supply challenges ease, although I'm afraid that inflation will remain high in many markets. So what have the central banks and fiscal authorities done? Well, in light of what they're, they're seeing in the economies, African governments have adopted very strong policy responses um, akin to um, other, other um, crises. We have seen central banks take a dovish stance across the region, cutting rates aggressively, like, Niger, um, like the BOG, the Bank of Ghana, the Central Bank of Kenya. And in other markets, even if the, the, the BCAO, the BEAC, which are the regional central banks in the CMAC and the Yoma region, we've also seen um, rate cuts. And this just seems to highlight the, the situation on the ground that is very, very critical. The pro-growth stance that we're seeing right now is likely to continue into 2021, but further aggressive cutting is unlikely as a result of the high inflation risk that we're seeing. On the fiscal front, the authorities have unveiled pandemic budget providing significant tax relief, cash handouts and credit supports for businesses Although on the downside, this means higher budget deficits in the longer period. But to cushion that, 
we expect consensual financing from multilateral agencies to provide some respite. However, once we start to see the data strengthening on the upside, we're likely to see a gradual withdrawal of fiscal support and a possible shift towards greater fiscal prudence and tax hikes in many African countries. Another key response by the policymakers is that they've participated in the debt relief initiatives organized by the G20 as well as the IMF. A total of 23 sub-Saharan African countries have participated in the G20 initiative and 16 have participated in IMF's debt relief. And this has helped to save about 5 billion for these markets, which will potentially be used for more important um, expenses in, to, to deal with the COVID crisis. However, on the downside, debt levels are likely to rise considerably, especially as some of these countries that have participated, such as Zambia, Mozambique, Republic of Congo, they're already in high debt distress, as we can see from the table. And most of these loans have been contracted from China. And participation in this debt relief has actually triggered Moody's to place a number of countries in particular B-rated countries such as Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia and Senegal on a review for a downgrade. Personally, I think this was a bit of an overreaction, but because these countries have not indicated that they will seek debt relief from private creditors and that they know already would, have, would be credit negative for them. And in fact, the debt relief should help to increase financing available for essential spending, which um, should increase the scope of recovery for growth and tax revenue, and in turn help to boost repayments prospects. Other major markets like Kenya have decided not to participate in the G20 initiative. And I think this is possibly due to the stigma attached to debt relief following Moody's reaction. And it could also be as a, a reason because they're concerned that um, borrowing costs will rise if they decide to return to the global capital markets in the future. So in light of the dovish central bank policies and substantial donor funds, local market yields have now fallen since March, and this is definitely good for government borrowing. However, on the downside, it's negative for investors in interest income. The falling yields is more pronounced as we see in the top left charts in Nigeria. And this is largely as a result of um, the reduced supply of OMO bills and the recent ban placed on non-bank local investors from participating in the OMO markets. On the right hand top charts, Ghana has also seen a reduction in yields and as Kenya, real interest rates remain in positive territory, which means that it leaves a lot of room for further cuts in rates. In terms of the outlook, the outlook for the local yields market remains broadly positive because of the dovish policies that we're seeing, as well as the donor funds, and this should help to ease financing pressures. However, on the upside, there's still a lot of risk. Inflation remains high, which could likely lead to an up upward pricing. And at the same time, if there's a withdrawal of policy support or monetary policy tightening, it could also apply upward pressure. In Ghana as well, there's election coming up, as Ted has just mentioned, at the end of the year, and that could see a spike in yields as political risk premium rises ahead of the election. On the external front, the crisis has severely affected the current accounts, and this has increased pressures reflecting rising structural imbalances between USD supply and demand. As we can see from the charts, the major oil exporters, as well as in, in, in Southern Africa, will be hit hard by the weak global demand, resulting in sub substantial deterioration in their current accounts. Although oil prices have now recovered to about or just over 40, they still remain below pre-crisis levels and as such, oil investments have reduced. 
Another factor that will affect the oil markets, I mean the oil major oil exporters, is the OPEC compliance, which has limited oil production significantly. For example, in Nigeria, uh, crude oil is now limited to 1.4 million barrels per day, excluding condensates, and this should have been 1.5, but because of um, non-compliance earlier in the year, um, Nigeria has been penalized for producing 1.5 until it compensates for the reduction. So we're unlikely to see an increase to 1.5 until September this year. Other non-net um, oil importing regions such as Awa, Yomwa, East Africa will also record larger current account deficits and this will have a number of implications for the currencies. The outlook is for a modest um, narrowing, but as this is contingent on global traveling picking up, and it is also contingent on um, sustained recovery in commodity prices. So now to talk about currencies. Well, currencies everywhere and always reflect the strength of any economy. In the top left charts, we see that sub-Saharan African countries have come under immense pressure, and this is owing to weaker FDI and widening twin deficits. That's to do with the budget and the current account deficits. But on the, on the, at the same time, they seem to have outperformed emerging market currencies, although this is largely to due, to, due to increased capital from multilateral agencies. In fact, in the right-hand table, we see that pressures are still mounting in middle African currencies with currencies like the Angolan Kwanzaa and the Zambian Kwacha remaining major underperformers year to date. The outlook for the currencies is definitely um, negative because of the downward pressure from the current accounts and the fiscal accounts. And overall, the degree of the currency weakness will vary per country depending on the exchange rate regime, the export mix, government spending, reforms, and the country's attraction to foreign investments. I'll now dive into four key currencies in Middle Africa, specifically the Naira, the CD, the Kenyan shilling, and the Zof Zaf. So to start with the Naira, the Naira has come under immense pressure since the height of the pandemic in March. As with Angola, Nigeria is now facing a liquidity crunch. And this is highlighted in the top left charts. Foreign exchange liquidity has virtually collapsed in Nigeria. The iron e window, which used to trade about 300, over $300 million per day in Q1, liquidity has now dropped to about $44 million per day on average. Last week alone, it's averaged about 27 million, which shows that investors have no confidence in Nigeria at all. So given this challenge, as well as the weak oil receipts, it's no surprise that we've been seeing a series of devaluation by the CBN in recent months. And this is to preserve the, um, the, the, the foreign exchange reserves, which stands at, the, at about five months of import cover. CBN has weakened its intervention rates at a number of exchange rate segments, at the wholesale segments, the retail segments, and the official rates, while also engineering a 6% depreciation at the IME window. Nigeria has several rates, and until it decides to unify these rates, then it will continue to have these problems. Even though it's actually um, made these adjustments, the Naira is still highly overvalued, as seen in the charts below, by about 20%. And capital inflows remain thin. This is largely because investors still have no confidence that these rates, which is 381 at the iron e window, fully reflect current fundamentals. If we look at the forward rates in the markets, the NDF is actually priced at around 457 in 12 months time, which is the rates that which markets are expecting um, the Naira to be at before they can decide to get full confidence. 
As such, until all prices rebound strongly and the CBN moves to harmonize the rates and show some kind of flexibility, we, we will continue to see FX liquidity challenges in Nigeria and sustained downside pressure on the Naira. As with the Naira, the Ghanaian city also faces downside risk. Although, unlike the Naira, the exchange rate provides more flexibility because it acts as a shock absorber of offering more price transparency. According to the top left charts here, we see that non-resident investors holding of outstanding government securities have declined since April, but not as much as you'd expect, given the extent of, of how Nigeria's experienced outflows. That said, proceeds for the the outlook for the city is for modest softening, given expectation of further widening of the deficit and, um, and the political risk premium ahead of the December elections. Proceeds from the 3 billion um, euro bond issued early this year and Cocoa Bot syndicated loan should help to provide some respite for downside pressure. And at the same time, Ghana provides a lot of gold, exports a lot of gold and gold being about accounting for about 40% of the country's exports will help to also limit downside pressures. With the Kenyan shilling, the Kenyan shilling, as with other African currencies, have come under immense pressure, and this is owing to the weak global trade, which has hampered exports together with lower remittances and capital inflows. Another contributive factor has been the high government spending that we've seen lately in response to the crisis, and this is likely to continue for years to come. Overall, I expect the, the, the Kenyan shilling to continue to be affected by these factors, but at the same time, the country has healthy foreign exchange reserves, which should help to mitigate the impact of the downturn. So with the ZOF SAF, with, with regards to that, um, the outlook will continue to be dependent on developments in the euro, which is largely explained, which largely explains the majority of movements in ZOF SAF. About 98% of um, movements in the in the ZOF SAF is explained by movements in the euro. So as, as a result of this, despite the shocks from the pandemic and possible election related um, effects from Cote d'Ivoire later in the year, um, the current accounts imbalances that we're seeing in the Yoma region or in the ZAF region, they are likely to be well insulated because of the peg to the euro. If we look first at the, the, the ZOF, the charts in the bottom left and the right hand side show that the ZOF exchange rates is more or less consistent with underlying real effective exchange rates. And this suggests that exports are kind of competitively priced. So um, I know there's been a lot of noise about devaluation in that region, but um, the data shows otherwise. And in fact, in May this year, we saw Macron cement its commit his commitments to supporting the PEG through the ratification of the CFA reform bill and that will continue to ensure continued peg and unlimited convertibility to the euro. In addition, the BCO, the um, Regional Central Bank for Yoma, has the view that current measures in place are adequate to address any urgent BOP balance of payment needs. And it's, this is especially given that the bloc has strong foreign exchange reserves standing at about 19 billion, um, and modest, modest debt, debt sustainability risk. The 19 billion um, equates to about five months of import cover. And if you compare that to CMAC, CMAC has um, reserves um, standing at about three months of import cover. Unlike the ZOF, the ZAF is highly overvalued, um, as we've seen in the right hand table. I mean, the right hand um, chart and the, the one at the bottom. And this is largely as a result of the shocks that it's faced over the years, the recent oil price shocks. And with its fixed exchange rates, 
um, the nominal exchange rates has not been able to adjust um, um, in line with um, the to meet to in line with the uh, um, macro equi equilibrium. So, in view of the rising external headwinds, the CMAX central bank has decided to enforce some regulations to control the supply of um, FX and boost its reserves. And at the same time, there's been a walkable blueprint that should help to lead to the currency's evolution and framework in terms of having developing a new cooperation with France. However, the timing for that is unlikely. No one really knows. And so um, given external pressures mounting, um, the ZAF faces a higher degree of uncertainty than the ZOF. And so we might see the authorities acting quicker than sooner in terms of um, devaluing the currency. Finally, to wrap up, um, I won't spend much time on this, but taking into account all the factors mentioned earlier, the strong policy support, the um, debt relief, the weak macro fundamentals that I mentioned earlier, um, we're likely to see uneven dynamics in production sectors in sub-Saharan Africa. I want to point out that there's a high degree of uncertainty that these businesses face, and most sectors will experience downside macro risk, which are likely to continue to play out next year and even beyond. But on a positive note, Sub-Saharan Africa is still a frontier market on many fronts, and this will help to provide a number of opportunities in a number of areas. Already we're seeing the ICT sector emerging as a top performer, and this is giving the region's largely underserved customer base. Thank you. Ted? Thank you very much, Guyton. So uh, before I go on to the very final section of the presentation on commodities and trade, I'd just like to remind everyone who is watching now that you can submit questions. Please do using the Q&A button. They will be curated and we're looking forward to answering them um, at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to finish by looking at commodities and trade in sub-Saharan Africa. If we start by looking at global commodity prices, uh, they have been slowly declining and they've been pulled down by energy, um, particularly since late uh, 2018. Uh, edibles, uh, such as things like coffee, cocoa, tea, have been broadly flat. Metals have had a series of highs, particularly in recent months. But the big story, of course, has been the collapse of oil prices in early 2020. The perfect storm of COVID-19, the spat between Russia and Saudi Arabia over output, drove some prices negative for the first time in history in April. Since then, they have climbed back a bit, but they're still at levels last seen back in 2016 and well below the previous peaks. But it can be quite misleading when you look at the aggregate figures for commodities, because when it comes to individual commodities, they've had very different fortunes indeed. This list here, using estimates from the IMF, compares commodity prices at the end of June 2020 compared with June last year, and you can see there has been a real difference in fortunes. The top performer is gold by far, which is not surprising considering gold is long seen as a safe haven for investment, and we could see the prices go higher as well. Rice has also surged since the start of the year since uh, to its highest level in nearly eight years. And there's a number of reasons for this, why it's 27% up. A lot of it is to do with the fears over COVID and food running out. There has been a lot of stockpiling by traders. Um, there have been some disruption to exports in India and Vietnam, where the virus is strong. And of course, there's the worry that the next season will be disrupted. What comes after um, uh, the, the first wave of COVID? All of this has driven up prices. This is in stark contrast to maize, if you can see the third bottom performer down 24% over the past year. Maize prices have been fairly flat for the past six years in a range of around $140 to $180 a ton, but they slumped 11% in the first half of this year. This partly reflects the fact there's a strong harvest in the US, but also this expectation of ample stocks and falling demand, particularly from the feed sector. Everything is ultimately connected. When it comes to coffee, Arabica and Robusta have different fortunes. Arabica prices surged in the first quarter of 2020 and are now where they were three years ago, although well below the peak in 2016. 
But prices have slipped in recent weeks on concerns over the lockdown, killing demand and expectations of a record Brazilian crop. In contrast, Robusta is down by about 6.4%, uh, currently at its lowest level in a decade. And this really reflects the relentless rise of exports from Vietnam, the world's second largest coffee supplier, but also swelling global stocks. When it comes to cocoa, around 7% uh, down over the last year, we're seeing um, cocoa prices at a 15-month low. Um, this really reflects the fact that demand has fallen. Now, it is true that during lockdown, uh, many stuck-at-home consumers are still eating chocolate, but they are not consuming it um, in restaurants, hotels and family gatherings, and they're not bullet buying it at airport duty-free shops. And this has driven prices right down to the bottom of the range they've traded in for the last four years. Tea has a similar problem as well. Cotton prices have been in steady decline. Um, they are now down 12% from last year. And this is really due to do with the surge in global stops, uh, in stocks and also the slump in demand for textiles and clothing. As the head of Topshop said recently, who wants to buy a new dress if you can't go out and show it off? And this is feeding through into demand for cotton. But the worst performance by far, natural gas and Brent crude, which is down a whopping 37%. As mentioned, this was to do with the impact of COVID, uh, the, um, the collapse in car and air travel, and also concerns over overproduction in the early half of the year. Since production cuts have been agreed, they have managed to regain some of their uh, losses, but even at $43 a barrel, oil is at its lowest price for the last four years, and it will require draconian cuts to get the prices up uh, much higher in the second half of the year. So now let's have a look at some of the um, uh, key commodities for Africa. Um, when it comes to um, uh, African crude oil production, one of its key exports, um, the, the picture had been quite good before COVID. Um, uh, Angola's crude, uh, Africa's crude exports rose by 3.9% over the last four years. And Nigeria managed to recover from the slump in US demand back in 2016. The US is now a major shale oil producer. It simply doesn't need Nigerian crude as it did beforehand. Other off-takers have been found, but we saw a 23% drop in production in Nigeria in the first quarter of this year. And that is because of the OPEC cuts that um, Gaiman mentioned. Angola's crude production has also been falling dramatically, 23% in the last four years. A lot of this reflects maturing fields, so falling production, a slowdown in investment in expensive offshore fields, and also the fact that there are um, OPEC cuts as well that Angola has to, to live with. The one bright spot is Libya, whose output has surged since 2017, despite periodic disruption due to the civil conflict. When it comes to cocoa, um, we could have a record on our hands with the 2019-20 crop. It's forecast to hit a peak of 3.6 million tonnes, led by Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana and Cameroon, all of which are increasing production due to good weather. The outlook for 2021 is also good in terms of production. But there are many concerns that hang over the season, particularly in Cote d'Ivoire, not just the impact of the pandemic, but also the election, which is very uncertain now, which comes at exactly the start of um, uh, the, the new cocoa season in October. And there are real concerns as well about environmental destruction going on here. Over half a million tons of cocoa is estimated to be produced in Cote d'Ivoire on protected forest land. And informal gold mining is also destroying some cocoa plantations as well. So a lot of risks hanging over the outlook for cocoa. When it comes to coffee, uh, it's a bright spot for Africa. Coffee exports are actually surging, even though globally they have been falling. The two largest coffee producers in Africa, Uganda and Ethiopia, have seen a surge in exports over the past year up to May this year. Ethiopian production is recovering from the slump in 2018 caused by the drought and the political unrest. But of course, the current situation in the country does again lead to concerns about what might happen in the second half of the year with the availability of Ethiopian coffee for the market. The worst performer by far is Tanzania, down 24% over the past year. And this is really because we've seen exports falling, mainly due to a lack of investment in the sector and the aging tree stock. Moving on to cotton, the mainstay of Francophone West Africa, we have seen a changing of the guard. Benin and Cote d'Ivoire are now by far the largest producers in West Africa, and they've replaced Mali and Burkina Faso. Mali's output has fallen by a staggering two thirds over the past decade, which you can see there, the green bar in the chart. Uh, this reflects the impact of drought, political unrest um, and lack of investment. But in Burkina Faso, we've seen a fall as well. 
This was due to the fact they had to reverse the rollout of a variety of BT cotton, which they discovered had poor fiber lengths, and that greatly reduced its value. That conversion is almost complete, which is why we see Burkina Faso up 10% over the past year. But the real concern for the, the sector remains that there is still so much of Africans cotton which is exported raw and the value captured in countries like Bangladesh and India and not in Africa itself. And then to finish off by looking at exports itself, Africa's exports are generally on a weakening trend and this was happening before COVID started. We've gone from a peak of around $35 billion a month in 2015 to around $30 billion now. And it's likely that they, they uh, contracted more uh, um, exports, particularly in the period from April to June, for which data isn't yet available. But when we look at the trade partners, they remain the same. The EU and China are still dominant, and the USA has been pushed to fifth place now, after um, the rest of Africa and India. This reflects both the fact that trade between Africa and Asia is surging, but also the collapse in American imports of Nigerian crude. But when it comes to intra-regional trade, um, there is a lot of uncertainty about the statistics. If we look at the statistics, here they are on the page from Intrasen, you can see that actually, um, according to these stats, inter-regional trade is averaging around $155 billion a year out of around $89 billion of trade with the world. This would suggest that inter-regional trade is actually falling as a percentage of over overall trade to about 13.8% in 2019. But of course, this data doesn't capture the vast volumes of informal trade that flow across Africa's borders. And if you've ever been to the borders between Togo and Ghana, between the DRC and Zambia, many of the goods there flow across informally, and in some areas, it's 100%. And this, in fact, gets to the point of why the free trade area is so interesting, which I will get on to in a moment. Um, the, the important thing about the Africa free trade area, um, there have been some delays. Um, the, 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 the area was due to come into force uh, this month. It has been postponed until at least January 2021, and it's possible that it may be postponed longer. I think it's important that we get into perspective what can be delivered by the AFCFTA. Uh, the process of integrating all African countries into a single market is going to be long and complex. It cannot occur overnight. But the important thing to remember is that creating a continent-wide free trade area is entirely feasible. Um, uh, by knitting together the existing trade blocks. Um, if you look, for example, at the, the map I have there, you can see that we have Comesa, we have SADAC and the EAC, all of which overlapped. We have ECOWAS and, of course, the CFA Frank Zone. There are already agreements between these zones and integrating them together very much would follow the same model that the European Union did when it was first created. So it is feasible. There will be disruption caused by COVID. There are border closures currently underway at the moment. But I think the important thing is to understand that um, it, they will not stop the integration of the CFTA. They might just slow it down. Now, when it comes to the benefits of the CFTA, um, everyone talks about the potential to increase trade and cross-border investment, and we can take those as givens. But I think there are three other things to consider. And for me, these are the big opportunities for businesses as well. The first is, um, the, the, uh, the, once the free market um, comes into um, force, it will legalize billions of dollars worth of informal trade flows. For um, millions of SMEs and traders and farmers who trade over the border illegally, illicitly, overnight they will be able to. And that will open up huge potential for um, what can be done in increasing those flows because they are legal. At a stroke, it will also stamp out a huge amount of opportunity for fraud and rent seeking at the ports and the borders and the trade value chain. It's often said that SMEs avoid taxes because they want to reduce their costs, but they end up paying informal taxes, payoffs at the border in order to get their goods across. Once that is legal, that will enable them to do so much more without paying those taxes. But the biggest opportunity is this idea of cross-border value chains for food and consumer goods. It is crazy that there are production hubs in Nigeria and in Kenya, and very often they don't actually export to the region around them. Once it's possible for goods to pass from the border of Nigeria into the Francophone area or to pass from the EAC into SADAC without there being any border there, it's possible then that you can have a manufacturing hub in one area, you can have an assembly plant in another area, uh, in another country, and actual consumption in the third country. And once you have those clear borders, it means a degree of efficiency, 
but it also means adding true value. You can create businesses that meet local demand, and that means they will not be totally dependent on international demand, and in fact, it gives them a very strong base. So um, the final thing I'd like to say is just about the technology which is available. It is really changing the game. Fintech, blockchain, regtech, and trade tech. They are all essentially the same technology. Blockchain got a bad uh, reputation because of its association with Bitcoin, but in fact is proving very effective when it comes to exchange of documentation, exchange of authorization, and KYC. RegTech is where you use machine learning to crunch the data when you are doing anti-money laundering checks or checking on KYC. That is proving effective. And trade tech, if you like, ties everything together using IoT or the Internet of Things so that all the devices on the ground can feed into a central database and you can track goods literally from farm to fork. Um, this is really going to change the game in Africa because we are reaching the stage where over half Africans not only have a mobile phone, but it is a smartphone and it has a 3G connection. And that means they can connect to the value chain as well. So the potential for what you can do digitally is huge. Echo Bank was one of the first banks to recognize this when it came to its digital strategy. And next Wednesday, Isaac Kamuta will be giving um, a webinar talking about the different digital platforms offered by Echo Bank to its clients. I highly recommend you sign up to that for further discussion of how tech is really transforming the value chain in Africa. So to wrap up the key takeaways before I hand back for the Q&A. First, with the global and political risks, COVID, we're going to be with it for a while. But this is the time for transformation. We have to incorporate COVID into our plans, not hope it will go away. Several elections raising concerns in Africa. And then when it comes to the macro risks, of course, uh, uh, what you would expect in a time of crisis, currency volatility and weakness, resource and infrastructure challenges. But there is an opportunity here for businesses. We have dovish monetary uh, uh, policies um, and an acceleration in certain structural reforms. So there's a possibility here for businesses to innovate, protect balance sheets, but also strengthen their strategic management and particularly the management of risks because there is a lot of fraud out there and fraudsters always use crises as an opportunity. And finally, with uh, commodity prices, uh, they very much reflect what is going on uh, in the global environment. We could see a turn in them if suddenly there is a feeling that demand is coming back in the world. But the key issue here, I think, is, is, to, is to really focus on the due diligence of clients, the due diligence of deals. Don't let anything slip through the net or you could end up in the situation of some banks that they have uh, with the recent collapse of traders that we've seen across the world. And finally, with the CFTA, it will advance. But this progress towards full integration will take time. The important thing is to realize how it could change the way the markets work there and think about how your business can benefit from that cross-border um, connection that doesn't have a, a massive blockage at the border. So um, that finishes our presentations. I'd like to hand back to Sebastian for the questions. Thank you very much, Ted. And thank you very much, Gaming. Just before we go into the questions, of which we have quite a number, so I'll go to the questions now. The first question is, what is your view on the sovereign's ability to refinance or settle maturing eurobonds in the near term? Yeah, um, right now, I think it's um, the, the sovereigns are actually facing major challenges. I mean, the first priority right now is to contain the spread of the crisis and help to support businesses. Um, for now, sovereigns, uh, they have actually been performing quite better than um, in March. Um, we've seen um, sovereigns like Nigeria and Ghana, actually um, their, their bond rates have now dropped to single digits from double digits in March. And this is likely as a result of the improved sentiments in the global markets. I think as long as the policy support continues in the global economic space, as well as locally in the region, um, I think that sentiments will continue to provide some kind of support for um, the bonds market. Thank you, Gaiman. And the next question is, do you see heightened political risk in Ghana based on the upcoming elections? Um, look, I think when it, when you're compared, there's always political risk when it comes to elections and there's always uncertainty. 
But I think when it comes to looking at the, the raft of elections that are going to occur in Africa in the second half of this year, Ghana is one of the ones that we're less worried about. Um, I think particularly because the incumbent uh, has generally a good record and uh, the likely candidate standing against him actually doesn't really have anything new to bring to the party. So I think the expectation is there is that the incumbent should be able to do well. But, um, you know, never say never in an election. It remains to be seen. It's certainly not a, a prime worry at the moment compared to the other places that we highlighted. Thank you, Ted. And the next question is, how will this impact correspondent bank lines for African banks facilitating trade flows? So um, since this is directed to, to the bank directly, I'm, I'm happy to, to make a comment on that. Clearly, the, the downgrades in some of the sovereigns ratings that we've seen across the board, as well as the impact of reduced oil prices in many of our oil economies has already transformed itself into a reduction in appetite from some of the global correspondent banks um, in terms of providing corresponding lines for African banks. There is, however, not a one-size-fits-all approach uh, as we, we have seen, and many of the correspondent banks are being a bit differentiated. They're looking um, firstly at financial institutions that have a certain degree of um, diversification in terms of their risk, geographical diversification, so to speak. So many of the banking groups, for example, operating across Africa have tended to, to benefit from not having seen significant drops in, in the credit lines that are available. And even where they see drops in appetite for one country, they're able to counteract it because they're present in, in other countries where they, where they operate. In addition to that, there are a number of financial institutions that already have a good track record with quite a number of the global financial institutions going through such difficult times. And based on some of those relationships, they are actually able to continue to maintain uh, credit lines. And, and we've seen that across quite a number of banks. Uh, and if I may say so, Ecobank inclusive. This impact on, on the corresponding banking uh, lines is, however, being uh, actively counteracted by the actions of some of the multilateral development banks that we've seen. And some of them have moved to increase their guarantee facilities. So you have some of these multilateral development bank coming out and providing guarantees to some of the global trade partners so that they can continue to provide credit to banks in the region. I'll move to the next question now. Moody's, the rating agency, sees the coronavirus as inflicting permanent damage and long-lasting negative economic and social consequences in Africa, especially for oil and commodity exporters. Do you agree with this view? I mean, if I can answer that first. Um, well, I mentioned that in the presentation, but um, I'm not sure if, you, if it's permanent damage. Um, yes, it's been an overreaction by downgrading a number of um, B-rated um, uh, um, countries in the region. Um, but at the same time, I think the G20 has put an announcement as well as the IMF to say that these countries are seeking a debt relief which should help to strengthen um, their economic base so that they'll be able to repay the debts later. So I think having, having said that, having the G20 putting out such a statement as well as the IMF, I think that these countries are in a better place to, um, to go to the global markets if they choose to in the medium term. Definitely not now because um, the situation is very precarious, but um, I think when the time comes, as long as they don't seek any, um, any debt relief from private creditors, because now they're seeking um, debt relief from sovereigns, bilateral sovereigns in other countries like China, um, and the EU, etc. But um, as long as they don't seek any um, debt relief from private creditors, then I think that they're in a very good place to avoid any credit default. Yeah, and could Thank I just, you, yeah, could I just, just say, please go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks, Lesson. Just on the question about the commodities as well. I think there is an argument to be said that there is long term destruction of demand for uh, crude oil and for energy in general. Um, we've obviously seen a catastrophic job in terms of people traveling, uh, not just going to work, but traveling internationally. But the reality is there are a lot of uh, businesses who were very used to jumping on a plane and going to a country for a three hour meeting who actually have found over several months they don't need to do that. And so if you actually feed that through into the amount of demand which is going to be dropped, we've already seen in airlines, for example, loads of planes being retired very early. There just isn't the same demand. This idea of what is necessary and unnecessary travel. I, I would agree. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to suggest that we're not going to start doing business face to face. For business development, you have to be face to face with someone if you want to build confidence and actually probe for those areas where there's an opportunity and where you can help out. But there is so much business that can effectively be done digitally. And the major barrier to that was actually the head, people not wanting to do it rather than technically. So there is a question to be said about the long term destruction in demand for energy. And at the same time, we still have the rise of alternative sustainable energy sources, which every year are getting more efficient, more affordable and more widespread. Um, but when it comes to things like food and when it things that like cocoa and coffee, that is something which very much reflects purchasing power. Um, as Guyman was saying, the expectation is we're going to be in a V-shaped return. As soon as the demand comes back, the processes will be buying like crazy to get, to get their stocks up and we will see prices recover. Thank you, Ted. The next question is, says, I understand why yields have fallen. That, as you explained, is due to dovish central bank interventions. But why have spreads contracted? Aren't we supposed to be in a risk off environment? Well, this is what I was saying earlier. There's actually a disconnect right now. I mean, everything's all over the place because of the COVID crisis. Um, in the global financial markets or in, in, in local financial markets in general, in the stock markets, um, you're seeing some kind of, um, of recovery. But then um, in terms of the local treasury bills markets, it's, it's a bit of a there's a bit of a disconnect there and that's largely to do with um, the government receiving so much support from um, donors and this has helped to reduce the supply of securities that they're actually um, putting in the market and in the process you know the yields are going down and the prices are going up and I think with this kind of disconnect in the between the global financial markets or the local financial markets, as well as the domestic um, markets, is likely to continue for a while, um, and largely because of the the policy supports that we're seeing and um, the dovish um, interest rates as well. Thank you, Gaiman. The next question is: How will AFCTA support the businesses in Africa? I think the important thing about the AFCTA in terms of how it will support, it's really what it's doing is it's in removing barriers more than anything else. Um, first of all, I mean, you do have the support in terms of uh, the international governments who are saying that we want integration to occur. We want cross-border trade, cross-border investment. But it's the fact that these barriers are being removed, the possibility to integrate markets where there are clear hard barriers. If we look, for example, within the CFA frank zone, Goods move very well within the within that zone, um, and uh, you know it's very effective. You have the same currency, you have the same central bank, you have the same legal system, the same language. But if you look at the movement of goods, for example, from Ghana to Cote d'Ivoire, officially very low, and the same goes for some movements of goods, let's say from the EAC into Central Africa. Uh, you know there were various bottlenecks or blockages between different zones because of. Uh, different laws and um, uh, different languages. So this is where the real opportunity is with the AFC, AFCA, um, how it will help businesses. It will basically open up possibilities. It's like someone removing a whole series of barriers from Africa and saying, how far do you want to spread your, um, uh, your business and how far can your supply chains and your value chains stretch? And the thing is, there is a huge amount of demand right in the center of Africa a lot of which could be met by not just importing, but also processing and manufacturing in the more peripheral areas. And uh, the CFTA will really open the possibility for that one. Yeah, if I can just add um, on, on the economic side, um, I think that is a great initiative 
Um, but I think if African um, countries, especially Francophone and uh, Anglophone West African countries can get together to launch the ECHO, um, a common currency that will help to promote interregional trade effectively. So far, there's been no indications about that because of the tensions between Francophone and Yomo in particular and Anglophone countries over the name ECHO. Um, and at the same time, the COVID crisis has actually jeopardized ECOWAS's plan to implement the ECHO anytime soon. I mean, there are certain criteria that have to be met in order to, um, to launch that currency. And so far, um, we're seeing um, rising inflation, we're seeing rising debt levels, we're seeing um, reduced um, external buffers, all of which would be important for them um, to, to reduce before any echo could be launched. Thank you, Gaiman. Next question is, how are your investment products connected to all these? And how insulated will investors be, especially with the expertise you have on board at Echo Bank? The issue of investments needs uh, clarification, essentially because we're a multi-business bank. Um, and the question is not specific whether this is corporate investment or personal investment and whether this is in equities, fixed income, or other types of investments. So we will probably be taking this offline to better understand the context of this type of investment, the um, question being asked with, you know, refers to. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Akin. Next question, this presentation has nothing on Zimbabwe. Is there a specific reason for this omission? Um, no, um, it has some bit of Zimbabwe um, in the Southern um, Africa cluster um, uh, in inflation, in terms of current accounts and in terms of real GDP growth. Um, what I'll say about Zimbabwe is that um, the prospects remain very bleak. Um, for now, um, they were already having major challenges and then COVID happened. So this has just simply exacerbated all the, um, the downside risk on that particular country. Um, food and fuel shortages remain um, uh, um, rampant. Um, the currency spread between the parallel rates and um, the official rates has been rising. Um, uh, since for forever. Um, uh, inflation remains, it, I think it's approaching a thousand percent now. Um, it's um, about up to last month, it was about 700 percent. So um, on that side, in terms of the fundamentals, they, they, they remain weak, but at the same time, um, Zimbabwe has a lot of natural resources like minerals, platinum, gold, and um, depending on world demand and China um, re recovery becoming stronger, um, we might see some pickup in that area. Um, also, because of the crisis, we've seen the US um, authorities decide to lift um, their, their, their bans in um, the agricultural um, bank as well as the infrastructure development bank. So this should help to provide some kind of financing for SMEs and other corporates. So it's a mixed picture in Zimbabwe, but um, I think now that we're seeing some um, supports from the US economy, we might see um, other um, multilaterals going in, in some time, sometime in the short term to help and um, reduce the risk. Thank you, Gaiman. Next question is on Nigeria. An economist in Nigeria recently told me that the economic outlook for Nigeria post COVID-19 is stagflation. Do you agree? And there's a second part to the question. For Nigeria, the chart shows risk of external debt distress as not applicable. Please explain. OK, let me start with the second question. Um, external debt is virtually, I mean, it's very low in Nigeria. It's less than 10%, about 7%. 
Um, so the problem with Nigeria in terms of the debt situation is not the external, it's actually the domestic debt. Um, but having said that, um, the do domestic debt is now, um, in terms of debt servicing, it's approaching almost 90% or it's just above 90%. Um, but that is not really an issue because it's local currency. Um, but in terms of um, the first question, um, inflation will, it, it, it's, it, it's, there's so much uncertainty in Nigeria and all depends on the exchange rates. Um, in Nigeria, the, 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 the exchange rate is the Achilles heel. I mean, if that collapses, everything else collapses. And that's why we're seeing a lot of intervention by the central bank at the moment to try to prop up the the uh, um, to, to prop up the, the reserves in the country. The country has about six exchange rates, different exchange rates used for different interventions in different markets. At the same time, it has a different rate of which is much lower for importers as well as for debts. And until we see a unification of rates, the risk remains very, very high. But if they decide to devalue sometime soon um, to the rate that which markets are expecting at the INE rate above 400, then yes, inflation is likely to spiral out of control. But I'm, I, I'm, I really don't think that the CBN is likely to um, reach um, to devalue to a rate of 450, 457 anytime soon. Instead, it will be closer to the 400 or um, just above the 400 range. So, but in any case, inflation will still remain high in Nigeria for some time. Uh, yes, I just, just also uh, one thing about looking forward as well in terms of Nigeria, there is an interesting dynamic which is changing there at the moment, and that is about digitalization. Uh, COVID has turbocharged the digitalization of Africa, and Nigeria is one of the key areas. Uh, in some ways, Nigeria was a bit behind the curve with digitalization compared to somewhere like Kenya. But we've seen, for example, a surge in mobile payments of 35% just during the first three months of the year, obviously because people have to. We've seen so many uh, market traders who are now using WhatsApp groups. We've seen loads and loads of the different bada bada drivers or taxi drivers who are now part of Uber or some Uber like hail rider um, uh, uh, app or, or sharing group. And we're seeing people digitalizing. And Nigeria has some of the greatest entrepreneurs there are in West Africa. Very savvy, very business savvy, looking for opportunities. So going forward, there is a, such a speed up in the digitalization going on, uh, on in, in Nigeria that that could really open up a lot of potential for business, which isn't just focused on the traditional everything to do with oil or stuff which is effectively supported by oil payments. Thank you very much. And that unfortunately brings us to the end of the Q&A session. This is so exciting that I'm sure we could go at this all day, but I know you don't all have sufficient time. I'd just like to assure all our listeners that all your questions will receive answers. We will come back to you with answers. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for your participation in this uh, webinar. I trust you found this informative, um, at least I did. And uh, judging from the questions, I think this has generated a great deal of interest. And um, as indicated, uh, questions that we were not able to answer on uh, this forum uh, will, be, will be addressed and, uh, and provided uh, to yourselves. Uh, thank you, Ted and Daimeen, for the very engaging content that you shared with us. Uh, there were some interesting insights uh, that were shared about several topics today, uh, including the economic outlook both globally and in Africa. Uh, these show challenging times ahead with a predicted downturn in GDP, supply chain challenges and political risks um, on the continent. Um, there was also talk on some policy measures uh, that uh, central banks are taking, uh, such as interest rate cuts, fiscal uh, stimulus measures and some tax reliefs. Um, we covered debt relief packages, uh, which selected uh, country governments have signed up for. Um, we talked about weakening of currencies. I think we ended, uh, Guy Min, uh, speaking specifically on Nigeria, but broadly uh, weakening of currencies due to lower exports and other pressures. Uh, the impact of uh, this pandemic on commodity prices and output. And last but certainly not the least, and probably the most exciting for the continent, is the intra-Africa trade and the potential of the 
uh, AF um, CFTA, which albeit slowed down by COVID, uh, will open up some huge opportunities for cross-border flows, and uh, we'll see significant continental value chain efficiencies kicking in. Um, so while the terrain ahead uh, might be rough, um, at Ecoban, 